So thanks to, to everyone so far. Uh, it's always fun being the speaker standing between all of you and lunch, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Uh, so we had an election about 10 days ago, as some of you may have heard. Uh, and at the end of an election there in this country, um, there are winners and there are losers. And sometimes the losers don't take it as well. Uh, and sometimes we have trouble counting votes, um, which is still happening in Arizona and Florida. Uh, but it still, it still happens. Uh, and there's always a peaceful transition of power in this country. Uh, and we always recognize the importance of our democracy. But I also feel that, that something happens at the end of elections. And in this country, especially this time around, people are absolutely sick and tired of politics and, and sick of democracy in this country and sort of just want to break from it. Um, I think we can, we can all relate that, to that to an extent. And, and I actually think that's, that's sad. Um, and, and I actually think, going back to the themes of, of what this day is all about, that the word democracy uh, and the notion of democracy is at the heart of everything. But we've sort of lost the meaning of what democracy is all about. And what I've tried to do throughout my life is, is really to figure out, well, what does democracy mean? How powerful can it be? Uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, What's our individual role in a democracy? So first off, there's a few different interpretations of, of democracy. So Lincoln is, is uh, a figure that has always been important and popular right now with the, the movie coming out. We're all thinking about him all the time. Uh, he said democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. Aspirational, motivational, uh, and, and something that he probably tries to, tried to espouse throughout his life. Another interpretation here. Democracy is only a dream. It should be in, put in the same category as Arcadia, Santa Claus, and Heaven um, by the, the writer H.L. Mencken. I'm not saying uh, that those don't exist, um, but, but I'm guessing that, that that's, what, that's what he feels. And so he's basically saying that this notion of democracy, the notion that uh, we can have a, a self-governing body where the people actually have power, doesn't really work. So I have some personal experience seeing both the good uh, and, and the absolute bad of, of what happens in democracy. So um, I, my, my father was in the State Department and I was able to serve uh, as an observer in the first truly democratic elections in Kenya's history in 2002. Um, so my dad dragged me to a rural village at the end of December. I had no interest in going. I thought democracy was something that you know, elections happened every four years in this country and we had peaceful transitions of power and something that you didn't really need to worry about. Uh, and we went to this rural village and got up at about five in the morning. And by 5.30, when we got out to these rural polling stations, there were lines hundreds of people long excited to cast their first vote. Uh, and throughout the day, we saw this same energy. They would go into to rural schoolhouses. They would cast their vote. They would dip their finger in indelible ink. And the whole rest of the day, they were, they were showing that finger because they were so proud that their vote had been counted. And that night, my dad and I went to a gym and they brought in these boxes that were locked. They unlocked the boxes and they started counting the votes. Uh, one vote for Kenyatta, one vote for Kibaki. Maybe that's a system we should use in this country. Uh, but, but they were so excited. And, and this event, the, the opposition candidate, Mwar Kibaki, actually won, which in emerging democracies is not something that happens very often. So this is his inauguration in 2002. Uh, and you had over 200,000 people in Uhuru Park. Uh, my mom and I were driving through downtown Nairobi that day. There were people on top of our car. Usually that would be dangerous. Uh, but they were so excited uh, to, to, to see that their individual voices had made a collective difference in their country. So democracy is great, right? You know, Kenya had seen the light. Uh, it was the best thing that had ever happened. Let's flash forward seven years. Uh, this was the next election that, that, that Kenya had. That same person, Mwai Kibaki, was up for re-election, uh, and all indications were that he did not have enough votes uh, to win this time around, uh, that, the, that the challenger, Rilo Odinga, had actually beat him. So what happened is that uh, there was sort of a, no one really knew what was going on. There was a lot of misinformation. All of a sudden, the results were published, and whereas seven years earlier, uh, Kibaki had stood in front of 200,000 people to take the oath of office. They did it at the back hall room of the presidential palace. They quickly administered it. 
uh, and people throughout the world knew that something fishy was going on. So the Kenyan people took to the streets because only seven years earlier, they had seen what had happened when their individual voices could make a difference and they had seen that taken from them uh, in, in elections that weren't transparent, in elections that weren't right. What happened is that 800 people died over the course of two weeks uh, as they fought for their democracy. And what happened is that instead of winners and losers, uh, Raila Odinga, the opposition candidate, actually formed a coalition government with Mwai Kibaki. Democracy didn't work. And what was amazing for me to think about was that seven years earlier, it was probably the best day in their history for many Kenyans to observe that transfer of power. And this period was probably the worst in their history. And it was both around this concept of democracy. It was both around elections. So another country, my, my parents lived in Zimbabwe uh, for the last four years. And in 1979, uh, Zimbabwe was one of the last African countries to gain its freedom. A guy named Robert, Robert Mugabe, um, who, who's in the middle there, uh, he helped gain independence. He was elected the first ever president of Zimbabwe. The world rejoiced. They had a, a big celebration. Uh, Bob Marley came to play, and everybody was so excited that Zimbabweans uh, had received their freedom. They changed their country's name from Rhodesia, and this was poised to be the new breadbasket of Africa. Let's fast forward to 2010. That sign says, no more uh, Mugabe. And I was actually able to, uh, to, to visit Zimbabwe uh, in the midst of their own election in 2010, when Mugabe was going up against the opposition candidate, Morgan Changarai. And very similarly to Kenya, after the election, everybody knew that Changarai had won. And there was about three weeks. We, we get concerned in the US when we don't hear results for about 20 minutes. For about three weeks, no one knew who had won. Uh, and, and then, you know, Mugabe published results that essentially meant that there would be a runoff election. And in the month between the real election and the runoff election, the Mugabe regime engaged in a campaign of terror. Uh, I, I was there during, during that, that period. I talked to folks that uh, were terrified, uh, that, that wanted their vote to count, but didn't know what to do. What ended up happening is that Chengra actually dropped out because so many people were being tortured and killed and Mugabe won. Again, this same thing, Zimbabwe, their best day in 1979, democracy at work. Their worst day in 2010, democracy also at work. Now, we think of this country as being the, you know, the best democracy in the world, right? We had an election just 10 days ago. Over 80 million eligible voters didn't participate in this election. Even though we know that there's not going to be violence on the streets, even though we know uh, that, that there will be transitions of power. So I think a lot about this because when I was in Kenya in 2002, I really saw how powerful that notion of individuals coming together to make a collective difference was. But I've also seen how incredib incredibly dangerous, uh, how incredibly cruel the concept of democracy can be. But the other thing is, is I've been talking about countries here. And there's a notion of individuals being able to participate in a democracy, the fact that all of us are able to gather here today, express our feelings, and know that we're going to be OK, that we can go to the ballot boxes, that we can cast our votes, and that we can make a difference. And for me, that's the core of what democracy is all about. It's not about the elections that happen every four to six years. It's about knowing that if I care about something, I can do something about it. I'm not going to be punished for it. I'm going to be rewarded for it. So another individual story of mine that, that takes us back to Zimbabwe uh, is, is that I know uh, I, I met a, a person there when my parents lived there uh, named Temba. And Temba had, had gone to school, um, had worked hard, had done everything that would be required for him to be an engaged citizen. He couldn't afford to go to college. Uh, and in Zimbabwe, his future was bleak. His vote didn't matter. His voice was not important. He ended up going to, to South Africa, uh, where he now has a job as a handyman. Even though he writes better than I can, uh, he speaks eloquently on the future of his country. But his voice uh, in a country like Zimbabwe, where elections like this happen, he doesn't know what his future looks like. So that, that brings me to something else that I think a lot about a lot. What is our actual responsibility in a democracy like ours 
where we can actually have some sort of power. You know, a lot of people, those, those 80 million people that, that didn't vote, they say, you know what, I don't, I don't care about politics. It doesn't affect me. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really need to, to get out there. I'll leave that for, for everybody else. You guys being here today, you know, there's a lot of people that, that, that didn't come out. There's a lot of people that aren't necessarily exercising their ability to make a difference. But is it a responsibility to make a difference? And that's something that I would challenge you all to think about. Because you all have demonstrated that, that you want to dream big and that you want to do something. But there's so many millions in this country and throughout the world that although they want to do something, uh, can't. And there's other people that, you know, don't feel like it's their responsibility. And so that gets at the core of, of what I've been trying to figure out and, and actually can't figure out. I run a program that is trying to empower young people in this country to be active in our democratic process. But I also think all the time of Temba who, who can't participate in the democratic process and who wouldn't be able to dream big and do something because he doesn't have those mechanisms at his disposal. And my argument would be that because we can make a difference, and yes, there are constraints, and yes, there's things at play that make it really difficult for our voices to actually matter, it's not just good for us to go out and do something. And just because we do something good doesn't mean that we should be rewarded for it. But it's actually our responsibility. It's our responsibility to show up at the polls every two years to show that our voices matter. It's our responsibility to engage with our community members to make our world a better place. It's our responsibility to do everything that we can to make sure that others have the, op have the opportunity to do everything that they can. So in essence, that's why I feel that this country and this world is all about making sure that we live in an actual democracy, a democracy in which every individual matters and every individual can come together to make a collective difference.